morning, everyone. Um, so let's, uh, let's just quickly recap where we were last week. We've introduced two important topics in the, uh, the prior class. The first was taxes, and the second was depreciation. So I'm going to summarize those just with some important points. The first is um, companies may deduct eligible expenses. to reduce their tax. In one period. Okay. So we had this concept that, and I showed you the formula, I'll come, come to show it again to you. But companies can always deduct what we call eligible expenses. And we had a big discussion in the class last time on what, what eligible expenses are. Just a quick concept of that, salaries, utilities, insurance costs, maintenance, raw material costs, pretty much every cost that is not a capital cost is an eligible expense. Okay, so let's um, then define basically what a capital cost is so that you get an idea then that everything else is an eligible cost. Okay, so a capital cost or also called a capital expense. These are expenses related to capital pieces of equipment. So this is a term that maybe is not so familiar to all of you, but a capital uh, expense would be anything related to equipment. So it's the equipment, the equipment cost, for example, the heat exchanger, the distillation column, the pump, something tangible that you're purchasing. Okay, so, so that's a tangible cost. You can touch it, you can see it, you're purchasing something that's physical. But capital costs also allow you to include not only the equipment cost, but you also have to design that piece of equipment. You have the engineering time, or if you're paying a third party like Hatch or Amec, or some other company to design the equipment for you, that's also a capital cost. So the design, the installation of that equipment, we'll talk about that more on Wednesday's class, the piping, installation, wiring, installation, setup, are also included in the capital cost. Okay. So setup costs are very broad, but that's intentional. So the engineering time that you spend getting that equipment tweaked so that you're going to get good production, often who's heard the term commissioning? So that commissioning period, all the expenses related to commissioning are also a capital cost. It seems kind of counterintuitive, but everything that gets that equipment installed up and running is wrapped up and we sum them all up into a capital cost. Okay? And that's going to be important because that's going to be our book value in the first period. Okay? So when you buy that distillation column, the book value isn't just the price you paid for the distillation column, but all these other associated costs add up to it and often are more than the value of the, the unit itself. So Joseph first. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to confirm that maintenance cost is in the line for that. No, maintenance cost would be which type of cost? I guess it would, it would be an eligible expense. Eligible expense. Okay, so one way you can see eligible expense is everything else that is not capital related. That's absolutely right. So the engineering team's hours and resources used by that team would go into the capital cost and essentially in increase the book value of the unit. Okay, so that trip you take to Japan to go check the equipment out can go in there as well. 
Okay, so all that design costs and expenses. Okay, so these, these capital expenses can grow pretty quickly. Okay, now what, this is important because we want to know the capital costs carefully because the government is going to allow us to deduct um, our, our expenses related to capital costs, but not in one go. So that was the whole of Friday's lecture. The government lets you reduce your taxes when you spend money, but when you're spending money on capital equipment, they, they make you divide it up into chunks over time in, in a term that we call depreciation. If you look at the uh, Canada Revenue Agency's website, though, they call it capital cost allowance. And now you can see why they use that name. Capital cost allowance. They're allowing you to deduct the capital costs, but in smaller increments. Depreciation is another word for the same thing. Okay, so depreciation takes the full value of the capital expense Okay. takes the value of the capital expense or the capital cost and divides it over multiple periods. If you're working in the United States, they have a different system for how that division occurs. If you're working in Canada, there's really only one way, and it's called the declining balance method, and that's the only method we will really consider in this course. There's another alternative called the straight line. There's the double declining balance method. There's a few others, but we only focus essentially on the declining balance. And we illustrated that in Friday's class. And we noticed that when we do that, you sort of get this exponential decrease in the book value. And that's a recognition by the government that an equipment is most productive and most valuable in its earlier life. Towards the end of its life, that, co that equipment is becoming less effective there's deterioration in the equipment. Newer technology is available. So as an encouragement, the government says, well, we'll let you deduct a lot of money up front, not so much at the end. That way, it's kind of a bit of an encouragement to companies to replace their equipment so they can get some fresh deductions going again. Why do I refer to these deductions? Well, if we look at the formula we considered last class, a company will pay tax in the following way. Their tax paid is equal to their tax rate. So companies generally don't have too much say on their tax rate, that's fixed. But what they do have influence over is the rest of the equation. Income minus eligible expenses. And then here's the important aspect to depreciation. So if companies can increase their eligible expenses or they can increase their depreciation, they get to reduce their tax. Any questions on that so far? Yes, Sean. Companies have tax brackets income? Yeah, there's uh, small business taxes and there's, I think the threshold is in. <laughs> Total, in, total sales of less than half a million dollars, they get a very generous tax rate. Very, very, like single digits, do, low double digits tax rate. Then I think a million dollars and above is, it kicks into the full tax rate, yeah. Okay. So when we looked at depreciation last time, I said most companies in Canada um, sorry, most depreciation we'll deal with in this course is what's called class 43 depreciation. So just make a quick note of that is most equipment is in class 43 on the CRA website. 
And what that implies is that your declining balance tax rate, uh, sorry, your declining balance depreciation rate is 30% for that class. So your exponential decay is of a rate where 30% of the book value gets deducted and it declines in that manner. So which is more favorable for a company, higher depreciation rates or lower depreciation rates? Higher depreciation rates, okay? You get to deduct greater depreciation at an earlier time if you get a higher percentage. So the government, often to encourage investment, so in 2008, 9, and 10, the tax code got really complicated because the government was making all sorts of concessions to companies to get them to invest into capital equipment and upgrade their technology. So you'll see higher depreciation rates and more generous depreciation techniques in the tax code. So if you look at Class 43's definition, a company can actually choose if they want to be in class 43 or class 29, and class 29 is for a limited period of time to encourage companies to upgrade their equipment. So the government uses this tool as a way not to dictate to businesses what to do, because a business can always choose what they want, but they use it sort of as like a carrot and stick type mechanism to get the companies to upgrade and reinvest in technology. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to think about, and this is important in today's class, and the example we're going to look at next. Is depreciation an expense, or is it an income, or is it a cash flow? Let's firstly answer the question, is depreciation a cash flow? Okay. Most people think no. It's not a cash flow. There's no money trading hands. No checks being written. No accounting mechanism to move money around. I can't sell you a depreciation. I can't go up to you and say, here, take my depreciation and buy it from me. Okay? I can't exchange it for money. So right there, you're seeing that depreciation is purely an internal mechanism to keep track of the book value of a piece of equipment. Okay, you can't buy and sell a depreciation. It's not tangible cash or exchangeable for cash in any way. But is it an income or is it an expense? Does money flow in or flow out? Any thoughts on that? Okay, so it's basically, it, it seems to be an expense because it's over here as an additional subtraction, right? So it's similar to this subtraction, except it's over here. Okay, yeah, Joseph? I, I would say that it functions as an income. It's not really, but it functions that way since it's a savings, right? Okay, so there's another viewpoint that it functions as an income. It appears as an income to the company's perspective because it's a, a savings in some way. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, like interest is an income in certain situations and, and other cases it's not. Okay, so actually the previous answer tells us whether it's an income or expense because it's not a cash flow it's not an income or an expense either. But the viewpoints of being an income-like or expense-like is valid and is often interpreted that way and can be conceived that way. But it really doesn't actually exist as cash moving around. So it can't be an income and it cannot be an expense. But it functions that way Oops. in this equation over here. Okay. So, so it's a good... It's a, it's a complex concept, concept to wrap your mind around initially, but I think it's useful to see it as some form of 
just a tax credit or a, a way to, for the government to encourage investment is the way one should see it. But let's see how that actually takes place. So I'm going to go back to slide 84 now. And this visual picture might help explain So we're comfortable with the idea of mass balances or energy balances. We've got material flowing into our boundary. So here's my boundary. I've got cash flowing into this boundary and I've got cash flowing out of the boundary. Now, the inflow is the easiest part. We always identify our inflows accurately. It's basically what you sell and you get money in from your customers. So cash revenues are really easy to determine. The expenses can be of various types. There's money flowing out. You're paying salaries, you're paying for utilities, you're paying for all sorts of eligible expenses. That's cash flowing out. You're also paying for those capital expenses. Okay? So that heat exchanger or the design costs for the heat exchanger or the installation costs. That's another cash flow out of your system. And what's left then, there's one other important cash flow out, and that's taxes. That's one we haven't considered. So if you see this boundary essentially as the bank balance of the company, that's all that cash flow is. When you see the word cash flow, just think bank balance. So when we ask you to calculate the cash flow in a company, it's essentially asking what's the bank balance? Well, if you're buying that heat exchanger, there's going to be a large outflow of money over here. If you're buying a new distillation column, there's a large outflow of cash. If you're paying salaries, utilities, raw materials, those are outflows of cash. They're going to decrease your bank balance. And once a year, there's this outflow of money that occurs. It's tax. But nowhere do you see depreciation flowing into the system, and you don't see depreciation flowing out of the system. But depreciation does affect this entry over here, tax, using that formula I had up there earlier. So that formula is um, a few, actually it's just one slide back, slide 83. I'm going to go through this, this slide with you in a minute. But essentially 83 row G here says your tax paid is equal to your taxable income times your tax rate. Well, what's your taxable income? It's income plus expenses, which are in a negative way, minus depreciation. So actually, let's, let's, this slide is messy for this purpose, what I want to go. I'm going to go back to, so it's a little bit a more clearer statement. That tax paid, that outflow of cash, is equal to income minus eligible expenses minus depreciation. So depreciation does affect cash flow because it affects taxes. But depreciation itself isn't a cash flow. So it affects, it affects other cash flows, but it's not a cash flow in and of itself. Okay. This is why we have to take depreciation into account. Is when we calculate our NPV, our NPV is essentially our cash flow accounting for time value of money. Okay. So this is going to become a, become a whole lot clearer in the example I'm going to work with you um, through in a minute. So let's, uh, let's do that, in fact. It's slide 85. Okay. Now, this is as messy as it gets. This has got all the elements of all the concepts we've covered in the course so far. And I'm pretty much going to spend the rest of the class going through this example, which is what that handout was for, that you got. So the handout has two sides. One side for you to make mistakes on, and the other side for you to practice a second time. So don't, don't worry about messing it up. It's also a PDF on the course website, so you can print infinite number of them for yourselves to, to, to get this concept right. Okay. So now in previous years, what I did is I walked through the class, and I went through every line here, and I went through every entry in this table, and people sort of follow it along, and they copy it 
and that's all good and well. But what I realized is people didn't really understand because they were just repeating what I was doing on paper and not thinking about it. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to bang your head against slide 85 and slide 83. So slide 83 has what column A, B, C, D, E, and so on mean. Okay. You guys can all read there. And I think as you work through it, just do the first period, so period zero. And if you're working ahead, you can start the second period, period one. But work through that example and figure out what goes in A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So I'll work through uh, this together. There should be a lot of questions, right? I don't expect you to necessarily have the answers. What I'm hoping here is that you've got a lot of questions so we can solve those together. Now, I've given you a page to fill this template in, but in practice, I want you to bear in mind that in an exam, that when you fill this out, just put your exam booklet landscape. Don't try to fill these sorts of tables in horizontally because you're going to run out of space. So just rotate it. We can do that and mark grade it this way to give you yourself the room to fill these tables in. So let's work through the first period here, period zero. And the first column A refers to the income. What is the income in period zero? Everyone agree, 20,000? OK, this equipment is plug and play. You buy the off-the-shelf analyzer, install it, run it, and you start making those savings right away. Other questions may say to you explicitly, you turn it in, uh, you install the equipment, but it takes a year before it's up and running, and those savings then would only kick in the next year. But with this equipment, it's off the shelf. <laughs> so we earn those income right away in period zero. So period zero, period one, you should have an income here of 20,000. Okay. And I'm going to make some notes here. We'll keep track of them. Our it, just simply write increased profit. So that we know that where that 20,000 came from. Okay. Most of the entries in the table should have a note associated with them. So you're basically indicating to me that that 20,000, where is it from? It's due to increased profits. Okay. If you just put 20,000, I don't know where that comes from. Okay, so every numeric entry in the table should have a note associated with it. Oh, you'll see now. Okay, so eligible expenses in the first period. Zero. Everyone agree with that? Any questions on eligible expenses? Okay, so, so zero. Non-eligible expenses. Is there a sign? Minus 75,000. Okay, so minus 75,000. Let's put a note here. Note 2. That's the total capital cost. So that was the cost of the equipment and installation. Do you prefer for us to put those negative things? Like I would write as a positive and assume all expenses are. Negative. Okay, as long as you're consistent with the formulas coming afterwards. But there's the formulas coming afterwards use the convention of negatives. It would be like income minus expenses, right? Okay, so. If you look in the slide, this is not going to show up clearly up there, but B, sum up all eligible expenses, use negatives. Okay. If you don't do that, then this B that you see here in row F, I'm, the convention is going to be wrong. So stick to A convention and be consistent. Okay. Okay. So minus 75,000, column D, what is your book value? 75,000, the book value in the period where you turn that equipment on and start using it. <coughs> Column E, depreciation. Answers? 
11,250. Okay, so, so let's uh, just make a note here for this one. The depreciation is 11,250, and that was calculated as the book value, 75,000 times 30% because you're in class 43. But we divide by 2 because we're in the first period, so the 50% rule applies. So you can just make a note of that for the 50% rule, class 43. So explain, explain your calculations in that way. Any questions on that first depreciation value? Cool. Uh, the next one, taxable income, column F. Eight seven fifty. Okay. So that's note four. So my taxable income. 8750 is because I've got total income minus eligible expenses or plus eligible expenses plus depreciation 11250. Okay. Gets me my 8750. The next column G is related to the tax paid. How much tax is paid in this first period? Any answers? Zero tax? Negative 2,000. <coughs> Any other answers? A positive amount? Do you have a number? Oh, positive 2,000. OK. OK, let's take a look at tax, tax paid. So the fifth entry here, tax paid, is we're at a tax rate of 25% on our taxable income of 8750. So we get a number of 2188. Okay. Lots of heads shaking in agreement. That's good. So then the final column H refers to the net cash flow. Remember, this is your bank balance. OK, so this is cash flow. And another way you can see that is bank balance. Okay, so when we think about our bank balance at the end of the year, we have to take all the incomes flowing in and all the, the monies flowing out. Well, there's money flowing out in two ways. You're buying this equipment for $75,000. You have to pay someone $75,000. So you've got a big negative outflow. You also have the tax that you're paying. You're paying the government 2,188. Okay. So your net cash flow at the end of the period, uh, let's, so this was note five over here. We we're up at note six. Is your 20,000, there's no eligible expenses. So I'll, I'll emphasize that with a plus zero. Our eligible expenses are zero. But we do have a large capital expense minus 75,000, and we also have tax flowing out to 188. Okay. And that gets you, you're going to have a negative bank balance, as you would expect. You've spent a lot of money in this period, so negative 57188 is your cash flow, your net bank balance at the end of that year. Okay, so far so good. Let's do the next period. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about those last three columns. The next period is we make the same amount of savings. 
So we'll just refer to the same note, note number one, $20,000 of savings. But in the second period, what is your eligible expenses? We've got maintenance starting to show up, so minus 5,000. Okay, you can make a note of it over there if you'd like. Note seven, just say maintenance. What's my non-eligible expense in column C? Zero dollars, okay? We've, we're not spending money on new capital costs in this year. So no capital there. Then in my column D, my book value. Anyone got a book value number this time? 63750. Six, okay, so that's uh, make note number eight over there. And I'm just going to So note number eight six three seven five zero comes because it's seventy five thousand minus one one two five zero. Column E asks you to calculate the depreciation then for this second year that the equipment is in operation. Okay, so nineteen one two five. Okay, so this is where the interesting thing is going to start to happen here. 19,125, we can make a note as well. That's 30% of the book value is 63750. So our depreciation is 30% of the book value. We're now allowed to give a full depreciation. The 50% rule was only for the first year. So notice that the depreciation I get to write off in the second period is actually larger than it was the first period, 19,000. Okay, then column F asks you to calculate your taxable income. So taxable income is all your income minus eligible expenses minus depreciation. So if we add those up, it's income of $20,000 the government lets you write off your maintenance costs. That's an eligible expense. Okay, so 5,000 of maintenance. And the government also lets you write off the 19,125 in depreciation. Okay. And you get a negative number now, minus 4,125. What happens when a company makes a negative income? They've made a loss. They get money back. What happens when you make a loss in your tax return? You get a refund, right? So the government will give you a refund. Certain refunds are refundable credits. Others are non-refundable credits. When corporations make a loss, they can, in many cases, recover that loss. The government allows them to actually carry that loss backwards and forwards to future years. And the amount of by which they're allowed to do that has changed over the past few years. So, but in general, it's about you can carry that loss back three years and carry it forward, I think, seven years. So it's a very generous allowance the government gives to, to corporations. So what we will do in this course, and it's a, it's a rough approximation, it's not very accurate, but it gets the idea, is that when you calculate the next entry, the tax paid, we'll put in there tax paid is 30% of minus 4125, and you'll get minus 1031. So the government will give you a refund of 1031. That's a bit of an approximation because the government actually doesn't give you a check for that amount of money, but they allow you to carry that forward to the next year to apply it. So lots of questions. TR.
Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Same question, I guess, yeah. OK, so it's a loose approximation. In the United States, they do not allow this. OK, so if you <laughs> landed up with this case, what you do in the United States and in some other accounting um, areas, that you just put a zero over there. You don't get that refund. You get nothing back for making a loss. Okay. The rules in Canada are fairly complex that this number may not be accurate. So I always say if this is what's deciding you to invest in a project or not is your tax refund, then you better be getting tax advice to make sure that that's accurate. But for our purposes of comparing projects, um, this is going to be in the round of error, and so we're not too concerned with this. H, column H is the net, net cash flow. So what is your bank balance at the end of this period? Okay, your bank balance is 16031, which is your income, 20,000 minus your 5,000 of expenses, minus your tax paid. So take a look here, minus tax paid is minus times minus 1031. Okay, so you actually get this money flowing back from the government as a credit. Now, if you've been paying attention to the interpretation of these numbers and not just simply plugging in with a calculator, so really thinking about what these values mean as you go along, you should have picked up how depreciation benefits a company. Okay? We would not have made this, we would not have paid such a low tax if it weren't for depreciation. If that depreciation weren't allowed to be deducted, 19,000, we wouldn't have made such a generous tax return from the government. Okay? So depreciation does benefit companies, it does affect their taxes. Okay, so what we'll do in, in next class is we're going to start to focus on how we estimate those capital costs.